Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center in Reston, Virginia. The NCC WSC's Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and, and adaptation and they aim to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sean Carter, Senior Scientist at the NCC WSC. Sean, welcome. Thank you, Ashley. It's our pleasure to uh, invite uh, Matt Kaufman back today and to give his talk. He was originally scheduled uh, during that time that the government shutdown took place. So. We're happy that uh, he patiently waited to come back to us six months later. Uh, Matt is the director of the USGS Wyoming Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit, and he's associate professor at the Department of Zoology and Physiology at the University of Wyoming. He conducts research on ecology and management of large mammals with a focus on the ungulate herds that seasonally migrate across, across Wyoming's vast landscapes. He's also director of the Wyoming Migration Initiative which was launched in 2012 with a mission to conduct research and outreach to better understand and conserve Wyoming's ungulate migrations. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Matt. Great. Well, thanks, Sean, uh, and thanks to the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center for inviting me to give this talk, tell you a little bit about my research, and thanks to everybody who's joining us online. Um, hopefully, the technology will all go smoothly. But if it's not, I'm sure someone will let me know. So I'm just going to jump into it. OK, I'm going to start with my acknowledgments. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is tell you a few, uh, several different studies. Um, each of No studies are going to be in depth. I'm going to kind of uh, go through sort of thumbnail sketches of four different studies that relate to climate change and its, and its influence on especially migratory ungulates. And the work, uh, is come, the work that I'm going to tell you about comes out of my research lab uh, at the co-op unit at the University of Wyoming, but it also has involved collaborations from a lot of different students and postdocs, which are listed here, in addition to uh, many different collaborators and many different funders. The co-op unit um, is, like all co-op units across the country, is a uh, cooperation between the university, the USGS, and the State Wildlife Agency, and in the case for Wyoming Game, uh, for the co-op unit, that's the University of Wyoming, the USGS, and the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Uh, there are many funders of the talks, uh, the studies I'm going to tell you about, but um, the Game and Fish was a primary funder on most of them, and also the USGS has been an important funder through the Wyoming Landscape Conservation Initiative, and also the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. And then I'm also going to uh, highlight three collaborators um, that have been important on uh, the projects that I'm, that I'm going to talk about. First is Dr. Kevin Monteith. Kevin is an assistant, um, assistant research professor at the University of Wyoming in, in the Zoology and Physiology Department and the, uh, the co-op unit. Next is Hall Sawyer. Hall is a research biologist at Western Ecosystems Technology, and he was a, a former PhD student of mine. And then finally is Arthur Middleton. Arthur. Uh, was also a former PhD student of mine and is a collaborator on uh, the elk work that I'll talk about. So to set the, the, the context for this talk, uh, I'm going to be, several of the projects I'll discuss have to do with migration and uh, migration of ungulates. Ungulate migration is declining uh, globally, and pretty much everything that happens on the landscape influences migratory ungulates, everything from habitat fragmentation, over-harvesting, roads, human disturbance, disease. So consequently, ungulate, migratory ungulates around the world are, sort of, are having a hard time, and their conservation is an important management consideration. In Wyoming, we're fortunate um, because we have very few people. There's uh, about 500,000 people who live in Wyoming, and so we have wide open landscapes, which are the types of landscapes that uh, ungulate migrations depend on. And even though we have wide open landscapes, uh, there are many changes that are occurring on those landscapes. And these changes um, challenge our understanding of how migratory animals will respond. 
So by way of background, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the benefits of migration and why animals migrate. So uh, in Wyoming and the Rockies, we have a really short growing season. And if you live here, you know that. For migratory ungulates, that growing season is even shorter because they have to access their forage plants when they're just starting to green up. That's when they're most nutritious. So migration, most of our migrations uh, in Wyoming and the Rockies are elevational. And, it, and so this is essentially these animals following spring as it moves up the mountain and accessing that high quality forage. During spring and summer is when these animals will, will put on all of the fat that they will carry with them when the snow comes, pushes them out of the mountains, and takes them back to winter range. In Wyoming, about 90% of our ungulates are migratory, and it's this foraging strategy that, that is, really, um, is really the reason why we have such an abundance of big game in, in Wyoming and elsewhere in the Rockies. So to dig into the foraging benefits of migration just a little bit more, as I mentioned, it's all about plant phenology. And so, so this is the general pattern shown here. Um, two attributes of, of plants that are important for ruminants are protein and, and fiber. And protein peaks right when plants uh, green up, and, and fiber as it is at its lowest right when plants green up. So, so here in this graph, you can see early May when plants first come up, they, they are they have the highest forage quality, most nutritional value for, for ungulates. And, that's, um, and, and those are the types of plants and the type of forage patches that ungulates will, will seek out. Recently, over about the last decade, we've uh, increasingly used um, remote sensed normalized difference vegetation indices um, to basically measure measure spring, measure green up on the landscape. And so what I'm showing you here, and hopefully you can see my cursor, is an NEVI curve. And, and I will be using these throughout the talk. Um, so the, the y-axis here uh, doesn't really matter. It's essentially greenness. So here you can see um, <clears throat> 52 weeks in the year. These are the winter months. Um, the NDVI is low. and then and then once it starts to turn up, this is spring. And, uh, and then uh, we, we green up, peaks in the summer, and then you have brown down in the fall. And um, we researchers have been trying to relate um, what this early phenology plant quality, um, how that relates to NDVI. And then generally, we expect that this, this period in the spring is, is when those plants are, are in their early phenological stage. So generally, uh, this period right here in the spring, as measured from NDVI, is when forage quality is highest for migratory ungulates. One last thing about uh, the seasonal migrations of ungulates. As I mentioned before, the fat dynamics is really important. So here are body fat, percent body fat measurements longitudinally for uh, migratory and resident elk up near Cody, Wyoming. And, and this is a very similar pattern. All, almost all temperate ungulates follow this pattern, which in March, so late winter, they're at low body fat. And uh, then they get out of winter, they migrate. And during the summer, they put on their body fat. And then they carry that body fat into them into the next winter. And so summer is the period of fat gain when they're accessing that high quality forage. And winter is a period of fat loss. And if the winters are long enough, many animals will starve. So fat is, fat is essentially the currency of survival and reproduction for these animals. OK, so I want to jump into the first case study, which, is, which involves uh, stopover ecology of mule deer. So this is work that I did with Hall Sawyer. And what, what Hall noticed, um, here, here's a typical uh, migration route, GPS movement data for migratory mule deer. You got your, their winter range down here, the migration path, and summer range up here. And what Hall noticed is that while these animals were migrating, there were also um, frequently periods where they're not moving, and they're, and they're essentially um, stopped over in the same place. And so he developed a methodology called the Brownian Bridge Movement Model 
which allowed us to, to highlight um, those periods where the animals are stopped over. And when you and this is basically a kernel UD for those of you who, who are focused on spatial analyses, but applied to a movement path. And what that allows you to do is then identify the stopovers where um, where animals aren't making much forward forward progress, and then also the movement corridors where they're essentially just sort of zipping through to the next foraging patch. So this was uh, this was kind of striking to us. These mule deer spend on a three-week-long migration, they spend about 95% of their time stopped over, and only 5% of their time actually you know, making their migration from winter range to summer range. When we looked across individuals, we saw that, that stopovers were a common phenomenon of all migrations. And this is, this is within mule deer. So here, each of these points is an individual mule deer, either it's spring or fall migration. And and what you can see is as you as you look um, at migrations of different distances, the longer the migration is, the more the more frequently or the, the the higher number of stopovers that the animals have. So so stopovers appear to be a critical component to the migrations of mule deer. We were curious why this was, and we uh, the, the avian ecologists, uh, those that study avian migrations, are are have are far ahead of us on this. And they've developed a stopover ecology of avian um, migrants for quite a while. And, and there, avian, avian migrants use stopovers to basically allow them to migrate as quickly as possible and get to their summer range, which is also their breeding range, and in, in time to establish the best territories. Um, and that prediction has been made for migratory ungulates as well. But, but we thought that. Um, the stopover use of these deer was probably had more to do with their tracking of early plant phenology, that high quality forage when patches are just greening up. And so uh, what we did was, was we took each individual and its stopover locations and we drilled down and built an NDVI curve for each of those stopover locations and then just asked where is, uh, when the animal is at this stopover location, where is, where is it on the final on the phenology curve, the NDVI curve. And that's what I'm going to show you now. So here's winter range. I'm going to go through uh, six different graphs here. They're all going to look the same. And this, this dotted dashed line is the peak green up. So this is, this is the NDVI curve here. So green is on the Y, day of the year on the X. Here's the peak. And then this dotted line is when the animal was there. And so you'll see that. The animal, as we go through, the animal is always there before the peak, and then you also see the peak move as we as we go up in elevation. So green up happening later at the higher elevation stopovers. So here's a stopover right next to winter range. There's one on summer range. You can, again, you can see the peak, and you can see the animal is using occupying that stopover about a month or so prior to the peak. Same thing for this one. Um, same thing for this one. The animals are always uh, at the stopover prior to the peak, about a month, maybe a month and a half. And that pattern follows as you go through to the last stopover for summer range. On average, deer use these stopovers 44 days, plus or minus just about a week, prior to peak green up. And, it, and if you remember the um, the NDVI curve that I showed you at the beginning, this is the time of uh, year phenologically for a foraging patch when we expect the forage quality will be highest. So as a, in contrast to birds, which use stopovers to migrate rapidly and get to summer range as early as they can, deer appear to use stopovers to slow down and, and essentially stay in pace with spring as it moves up the mountain. And Ecologists are increasingly referring to this as riding the green wave. So, so this is our first indication uh, at kind of a broad landscape scale that phenology and phenology tracking is critically important for these migratory ungulates, and it has a lot to do with the foraging benefit that they receive from migrating. Okay, I'm going to shift now to uh, what's referred to as trophic mismatch. Uh, I'm going to show you a study looking at this in 
in moose, but I'm going to start with birds. So the idea here with trophic mismatch is that phenology is advancing on summer ranges, but animals, migratory animals, might be missing the cues on their winter range. And so this example comes from pied flycatchers that winter in, in Central Africa, and then and then they summer, or their, their breeding range is up in the northern latitudes, conifer forests of, of Europe. So for these, for these birds, um, we, th this creates a problem because most warming, we know, is occurring at high latitudes on the breeding range of these animals. But they are using genetic cues to decide when to migrate from low latitude. And that can be seen in these graphs here. So this first graph shows. So temperature is on the x in both of these graphs. This first graph shows on the y mean laying date. So this means that once they get onto breeding range, uh, they adjust when they lay their eggs according to the temperature, and they can do that well. But this graph, the second graph, shows mean arrival date when they get to their breeding range as a function of temperature. And as you can see, there's no relationship. So this means that they're not able to time their migration and their arrival to breeding range um, in, in concert with, uh, with the temperature that spring. And so, so this is referred to as a, as a trophic mismatch uh, because they're using cues on one seasonal range that, uh, that tells them when to migrate, but it's mismatched with the phenological change, the advance of spring or the advance of, of the hatching of, of insect prey um, that's happening on their, on their breeding range. So this has been suggested to be happening in, um, in migratory ungulates. And I'm going to show you some work that we've done with moose in Wyoming that uh, allow for a test of this idea. Before I do that, I'm just going to just uh, to, to sort of let everybody know we certainly have, have had our fair share of warming in Wyoming. This is a graph uh, put together by uh, Brian Schumann, who's an assistant professor at the University of Wyoming. And uh, this, is, this is not a model. This is just data from uh, all the, the temperature and precip sites across the state. And what you can see, and so this is just mean annual temperature uh, essentially for the last century. And what you can see is that there's consistent, I mean, there's quite a bit of noise, but there's a consistent warming pattern across the last century. And that warming pattern, pattern is particularly pronounced in the, in the last 30 years. And Brian's has published work that shows that you cannot get the temperature uh, patterns that we've had in the last 30 years by sort of randomly simulating them from the previous 70. So this is sort of outside of the range of, of variability that we've seen over the last uh, the, the 70 years prior. So, so quite a bit of warming in the state. And then the question is, um, what does that do to phenology, and can moose track it? So the, the setup for this project is pretty simple. Basically, um, we captured a bunch of moose and put GPS collars on them. Um, what's important here is that these GPS collars give us hourly locations, which, which, as you'll see, basically allows you to very easily identify when they're on winter range, the day that they migrate, how long they migrate, when they get on summer range, et cetera. So that's, that's what I'm showing you here. Um, this is, uh, you can see the study area here where here's Jackson Lake, Grand Teton National Park. These animals all share a common winter range in this low elevation valley, Buffalo Valley. Uh, and then, then they all begin their migrations and they, they migrate up to individual summer ranges, uh, which are all at higher elevation. And uh, one of the aspects of this that's critical to this story is that these animals have extremely high fidelity to both their winter ranges and especially their summer ranges and even their migration routes. And I'll show you that now. So this is just one animal. And what I'm showing you is uh, its winter range and then its spring migration in green, its, its summer range in sort of this dark green, and then its fall migration. OK, so that's. That was this animal's migratory pattern in 2005. I'm now going to show you 2006. As you can see, very similar pattern. Uh, went back to the same summer range, used the same, even used the same migration routes. 
This animal was also um, collared in 2009, and you can see her pattern, her migratory pattern there, um, very similar. And again, extremely high fidelity to her summer ranges. So because of this high fidelity, this essentially um, allows us to, in, in, a, in a way, substitute space for time. So these animals are all going to different summer ranges. Those summer ranges differ along an elevation gradient. There's basically an elevational gradient from, from this low elevation winter range to uh, the high elevation summer range and, in, uh, and, and as you get up into southern Yellowstone. So that, so um, there's at a minimum a 500 meter elevation difference among the summer ranges. So low elevation summer ranges are 500 meters lower than the high elevation summer ranges. And we know that um, from plant phenology studies that that equates to at least 25 day difference in the timing of green up on those summer ranges. And because of the high fidelity, these animals are basically bound to the summer to these summer ranges. And so they're basically, when they migrate, they're going to go to summer ranges that should vary considerably in the timing of green up. And so the question becomes, are they able to track um, this change in phenology, this spatial variation phenology, in the timing of their spring migration? And the answer is yes, that they, 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 they can and they do it quite well. So here is, on the X is the summer range elevation. So this is the elevation of the summer range that the animal is going to in their spring migration. And this is, and here on the Y is the beginning, is the Julian day for the beginning of their spring migration. So you can see um, those that are going to low elevation summer ranges leave early. Those that are going to high elevation summer ranges leave late. And what's remarkable is there's about a two month variation in the timing of these spring migrations. Okay, so these animals appear to be able to track the changing phenology due, due to elevation on their summer ranges. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this section just showing you a, a short man, animation of four moose. And so here are those four moose. Um, these three are still on their winter range. It's the middle of May, so about this time of year. And in the background here is NDVI. So these, these areas in green are areas that are starting to green up. So you can see middle of May, Moose number 146 goes to its low, lower elevation summer range. A week or so later, Moose 124 goes, and you can see that it's one of the few summer ranges that, is actually, that have actually greened up at this point. Why don't you focus your attention on this northern central part of the screen here. Um, this is one of the last, this is one of the higher elevation habitats. It's the summer range of this animal that's in purple, and it'll be the last to green up. So. Fast forward to first week of June, and moose number 178 goes, and then finally, uh, end of June, early July, that high elevation migrate moose 175 goes. And so, so these animals, uh, we, we don't know how they do it. They're all queuing into the same environmental cues on winter range, because the conditions are the same for every animal on winter range, but, they're, but they have some type of cultural memory, certainly for the summer range they're going to, and also when they should get there. Um, so this, there's such huge variation in phenology that these animals are already dealing with because of the fidelity they have to summer ranges of different elevation that um, the incremental change that we ex that in, in phenology that will that will come from climate change is is likely very easy for them to deal with. So the conclusion here is that we don't expect um, strong trophic mismatches mismatches in the timing of phenology and arrival for migratory moose in this case, and I wouldn't expect it for other migratory animal, migratory ungulates, those that, um, and part of it is, is that these animals are queuing in on phenological gradient rather than genetic cues. Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, elk up near Cody, Wyoming. So uh, this is a partially migratory elk herd and, and this map shows you the migrants and the residents. Migrants are in black. Here's their winter range. The migrants and the, and the residents share range or share part of their range. This is the winter range of the, 
of the migrants. And this is the year-round range of the residents shown in white or gray. And then, of course, when spring comes, the migrants move up, uh, and most of them summer inside Yellowstone National Park. Um, so this was a very large study. We collared over 90 uh, cow elk. And, and again, we had very detailed GPS collar information on these animals. This project was initiated because um, managers, collaborators with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department had seen dramatically different um, trajectories in the calf recruitment rates, the annual calf recruitment rates between the migratory segment and the resident segment. And so uh, those are shown here. So this is cows per 100 cows. This is, this is from the annual surveys, aerial surveys that the Game and Fish does. And what you can see is for the migrants, the Yellowstone migrants, their, their calf recruitment rates have been declining. And, they're, and they're, over the last few years, have been in the mid to low teens, which is really low for elk, whereas the residents are, are, are doing quite well. And so, uh, so we started this study in 2007. And one of the things we immediately saw when we started capturing animals is that those Yellowstone migrants have um, in addition to the, to the low calf recruitment, they also have really low rates of pregnancy. So here's that pregnancy rate for the migrants, 73%, which is extremely low for Rocky Mountain elk, as, as, a, as opposed to the residents, which have a more typ a typical uh, pregnancy rate of about 90%. So that was the first indication that the low pregnancy rates was one of the, one of the factors contributing to the low calf recruitment for the Yellowstone migrants. So pregnancy in temperate, temperate ungulates is essentially driven by growing season dynamics. So these animals put on their fat during the summer, and it's the amount of fat that they have at the end of summer going into fall that determines whether or not they will breed. So there's basically, you, you know, the animal uh, essentially has the means to assess how much energy reserves it has prior to winter and before breeding, and then that uh, is basically the trigger of whether or not uh, to conceive. And so since we had low pregnancy rates, we, um, and knowing the importance of growing season dynamics, we focused on what changes may have occurred in the, in the, on the summer range, the growing season range of the migrants versus the residents. And first I'm gonna show you temperature. So we know that we've been in a drought in this region and that is particularly clear when we look at the summer range. So both of these graphs are from the summer ranges of the Yellowstone migrants. You can see there's been about a 30% reduction, quite a bit of noise, but nevertheless, a 30% reduction in the uh, annual precipitation on the summer range of the Yellowstone migrants, and a, a fairly uh, dramatic increase in spring and summer temperatures. Um, July, in particular, showed an 8 degree Fahrenheit increase over the last 21 years. So less precipitation and, and higher temperatures on the summer range of the migrants. And the question is, does that, how has that altered phenology? And so in this analysis, we did, we, we did not, well, we, we looked to see if the timing of spring had changed, but there were no important differences in the timing of spring, but, in, but instead, knowing the importance of the early spring phenology, we focused on changes in, in basically the early growing season, looking specifically at the rate of green up. Um, again, when, animal, when, when the landscape greens up fast, that tends to be bad for, for migrating ungulates um, because it means that there's less, uh, it gives them a shorter window of time to seek out the early, uh, high quality early phenology forage. So we looked at the rate of, we looked at the rate of green up and also the duration of the green up period. And that's what I'm gonna show you next for both migrants and residents. Okay, so first on the, on the residents, non-migratory range, um, I'm showing you the max NDVI increase. So that's essentially the rate of green up that I was just re referring to on the NDVI curve. And then also the, the, the duration, so the number of weeks in which green up was, that early green up was occurring. And so on the resident range, 
no change in um, the pattern of green up and, and the duration of green up for residents. But on the migratory range, you can see um, there's, there's quite an important change, and that change uh, is in the direction that shortens the duration that these animals can access early phenology plants. And so uh, the rate of increase, the, the rate of green up has increased, and the duration of green up has decreased. And, and we attribute this to uh, the, this, this change on the landscape to the low pregnancy rates that we saw with these animals. Um, one other portion of this project, uh, we also looked at uh, predators that uh, the, 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 the density of predators that the residents and migrants um, were experiencing. And here there's also a pretty strong predator gradient. So um, looking at grizzly bears on the, on the migratory range, so these, this is summer range inside Yellowstone National Park, there's been an increase in the number of grizzly bears uh, observed in annual monitoring. And then uh, when you look at the number of wolf packs that the migrants and residents experience, the, the migratory animals um, experience a much higher uh, exposure to, to wolves. And both of these changes in the distribution and abundance of grizzly bears and wolves uh, have shown to be related, especially the grizzly bear part, to increases in, um, in calf mortality and calf predation rates on neonate calves. So, so there's a predator gradient that these animals are dealing with, and, it's, and it benefits the residents as opposed to the migrants. So what this looks like is that because of drought and, and essentially predator restoration, we're shifting the benefits of migration towards the residents and, and diminishing the benefits for the migrants. And this just sort of happens to be how these things lay out on the landscape. So in this case, the migrants are going up into Yellowstone, um, which is you know, where we keep all of our predators. And it's those higher elevation habitats that have seen um, persistent drought. And then on the low elevation habitats where the residents reside year round, we remove carnivores through lethal means to reduce conflict with livestock. And in some cases, those residents can access, access irrigated pastures as well. So this study, this study sort of highlighted the way in which some of the benefits of migration were shifting between residents and migrants. OK. Final study I'm going to talk about is moose. And moose have been a conservation concern in Wyoming for a, a number of years. And we've seen low calf recruitment. And, and this analysis sought to evaluate whether there was a climate or plant phenology signature that was driving the low calf recruitment that we see in the state. This study relies on composition surveys, calf-cow ratios, which are admittedly crude, but they're, they're an estimate that we have every year, and, and statewide, not just in Wyoming, but in adjacent states. And so these are basically done in early to mid-winter. And, and we have a data set that went from 1980 to 2009. Um, so the primary response variable here is going to be the calf-cow ratio, which is an index of calf recruitment. Um, and, and in this case, those are analyses weighted um, calf recruitment by the uncertainty in, in the estimate. So we do appear to be seeing somewhat regional declines in calf recruitment. Uh, I think we had about 19 herds that we looked at. And, and this shows you the, the eight or so herds in which there were significant temporal declines in calf recruitment. And so the question that we addressed was, what are those, what's driving those climbs, and is there a climate signature? So geographically, this is, these are the, the herds that we studied. Almost all of the herds in Wyoming, including some of those in northeastern Utah, and, and one in northern Colorado. The, one, the moose herds, these are the herd units shown in these polygons. The red ones are herds that show significant declines in calf recruitment. So what's driving it? Um, one of the primary drivers from the, coming out of this analysis is annual temperature. And so, so this graph shows you uh, standardized calf-cow ratios. So a zero in this case is an average 
number of an average level of calf recruitment. Uh, so that and and this is above average. You know, this is above average, and below zero is obviously below average. On the X in this case is this was a multivariate analysis, and uh, but essentially this teases out for for each year, each herd unit, whether it was a cool year or a warm year, or or some continuous measure in between those. And what you can see, especially for the declining herds, which are shown in red. Um, annual temperature in the year prior has a strong influence on calf recruitment. So cool years, when it's a cool year, um, we see large calf crops following the cool years. And we see lower calf crops following the warm years. So this has, so this is temperature, but uh, we looked at the same sort of rate of green up. And, and that, um, those phenological variables were also important. and and we're also in the direction that you would expect. And just to show you that graphically, um, there's considerable variation in the rate of green up. This is now for moose summer ranges. I'm focusing just as an example on Jackson, Wyoming, which is one of our focal moose herds, very important herd in the state. And so here are two NDVI curves, which show, which show you the difference between what rapid green up, whoa, uh -oh. Hold on a second. There you go. You're my back. back. My back? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so this shows you what um, <clears throat> what rapid green up looks like and uh, compared to a year in which there was slow green up. And so essentially, um, we're again finding, finding an effect that these years of slow green up are good for moose calf recruitment and that that's manifest in the following year and the number of calves that are counted. whereas these years of, of uh, rapid green up essentially shorten the period of time when these animals can find the highest quality forage. Okay, so this is sort of consistent with um, with the elk study and consistent with the consistent with um, the stopover work as well, which shows that that the ability of these animals to track phenology is really important. And it influences. You know, this is all mediated to presumably the fat that they gain on summer range, and then how that plays into their demography. Okay, a last piece to this is in in some of the herds where we've seen low pregnancy rates, we also have been measuring fat. And so this is Dr. Kevin Monteith shown in, in the orange here. Um, Kevin is an expert on the nutritional condition of of temperate ungulates, and he's shown here using an ultrasound to measure rump fat on this moose. And uh, when you take the rump fat measurement and, measurement and combine that with some morphometric and some other palpation scores, he's able to estimate and uh, the percent body fat of the, an the animal. And that's on the x-axis of the graph shown here, uh, ingesta-free body fat uh, on the x. And, and here you can see on the top is pregnancy. So um, animals that are poor, that have poor body fat that they essentially brought with them into winter are less likely to be pregnant. And, and those that have high levels of body fat in winter are more likely to be pregnant. And then on this bottom graph, you see the same relationship, uh, but for adult survival. So, um, so in this case, uh, that, that the, the fact that body fat is influencing pregnancy points to a growing season influence on these animals, and that's presumably translating um, into the poor calf recruitment. Okay, to summarize, um, I, I've told you about four different studies. Um, all of these studies had to do with phenology. Stopover ecology with mule deer um, indicates that for mule deer, tracking phenology is critically important um, and, and it is in some ways the primary benefit of the, of the migrations that they undergo. In moose, um, they appear to have the ability to track changing phenology or spatial variation in the phenology on their summer range, the summer ranges that they're bound to. In the elk, shift, the shifting benefits of migration, we saw a 
reduction in the length of the growing season on the, on the high elevation summer rain of Yellowstone migrants. And so this, um, we didn't see an effect of trophic mismatch for the moose, but we do see this effect of not advancing of the phenology, but a shortening of the time period of early phenology, shortening of the duration of early phenology. And then finally, we, we see something similar um, with drought and calf recruitment in moose, that it's those cool years that have um, slow green up that are good for moose uh, calf production. So I just want to touch on uh, some of the next steps for this, this type of research. Um, most of what I've shown you today uses remotely sensed patterns of phenology um, through the, the NDVI co curves shown here. And then in some cases, I've connected those to demography, pregnancy, or calf recruitment. And at one level, this, is, this indicates the, the, the importance of, of uh, phenology, including phenological patterns that we can measure from space. Um, because, you know, this is a fairly crude measure, and yet we're still seeing um, pretty uh, revealing relationships with the demography of these migratory ungulates. But on the other hand, um, this should also be a little bit worrisome because we're, we're having to, to make a pretty big leap between these remotely sensed measures of phenology and phenological change and demography. Um, and, we, and of course, we'd like to have a better handle on these relationships. And so some of the work that we're, we're looking towards next is basically connecting some of the dots um, between phenology and demography. So you can imagine, take this NDVI curve and imagine that curve along this migration route at you know, every sort of pixel on the landscape. And then we need to scale up and look at you know, when are the individuals at each of those pixels relative to the phenology, how well are they tracking it. And then we need to we need to crosswalk between remotely sensed greenness to what the plants are actually doing and forage quality measurements of the plant. And then we need to look at what the deer or or elk or moose are doing in terms of which plants they're selecting and then relate that to the the amount of fat gain that they're getting in the summer, how much of that they're carrying with them over winter and then finally relating that to demography. Because ultimately the goal here is to understand how climate change and drought and changing patterns of phenology will influence the performance of these big game species and, in this, and, and, and also relatedly the fitness benefits of migration. And to do that, we need a much more mechanistic, mechanistic understanding. So I've connected some of those dots today, but th there's quite a bit that we don't yet know. And, and I think some of, Zooming in on some of these mechanics is what's going to be necessary to get to develop a more predictive understanding of how phenology will alter the demography and fitness benefits of migratory ungulates. Okay, that's all I have. I thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Matthew. So we do have a question from Gregor Sherman, and he says, "Do the patterns and relationships you're seeing in your region?" Have any bearing on moose declines in Minnesota? Um, that, well, that's a good question. I think so. Um, so first off, they've been seeing much stronger moose declines in Minnesota, and um, you know. So I mean, the short answer is, is I don't know how much of what we're seeing is is similar to what they're seeing in Minnesota. That's one of the challenges of, of translating um, climate effects, phenological effects. Uh, one of the debates has been, and I, I didn't get into this, but um, so we're seeing, you know, warming temperatures are bad for moose. There's that that can be operating in two different ways. The one that I focus on is the influence of warmer temperatures on phenology and patterns of plant phenology that moose exploit. And so, so that's a link between warming and you know, forage quality. But uh, in Minnesota, uh, and, and this is an interest here in the Rockies too, but, it, but in Minnesota, my understanding is that there's, there's also a, a question of whether higher temperatures um, 
are leading to heat stress of moose and, and whether or not, I don't, I don't think, I think the jury's still out on this, but whether or not um, the warming temperatures actually um, reduce uh, you know, physiological performance of moose through some type of heat stress mechanism. So uh, there's some similarities, but definitely some differences as well in, in you know, how much of our research here translates to Minnesota. Thank you. And then from Carol, she says, do you know any similar studies being conducted in Alaska with ungulates? Um, well, I, uh, let's see. I mean, I, I, I don't have a detailed knowledge of, you know, some of the ongoing studies in Alaska. Uh, I, I guess I... Uh, I saw a, a study published recently looking at moose migrations in Alaska, and um, and I, get, I guess I'll just, I'll just mention that what was kind of striking there is that they were seeing um, a really strong influence of predation on on migratory animals, um, in which the migratory animals, because of because of where they were migrating to, allowed them to escape. Uh, predation and have lower rates of predation than resident animals. Um, there's certainly, you know, th this type of work. Some of the, the, the work that I've described today is happening, you know, throughout the U.S. throughout the world. Um, I guess in, in terms of the um, in terms of the phenology, um, the, the phenological changes and relating those to demography, I haven't seen anything recently coming from uh, Alaska, but there are lots of ongoing efforts, in, in, including um, a lot of work with, with caribou in particular. Okay, thank you. Uh, from John Gross, it says, have you tried to portion out the likely effects of predators versus climate-related effects in the Gross Ventra wintering herds? If so, can you summarize? What, in which wintering herds? Um, it's the Gros Ventre. Oh, the, the Grovant. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have not we have not worked um, in in those herds, um, and uh, I presume I presume this this well, I guess this question could be either about moose or elk. Um, I, I guess I'll answer it from the, from the elk side, um, and, and but the answer is kind of similar for moose. This has been one of the challenges in in under, understanding the influence of. Well, I'll, I'll work it from, from the predator side. There's been a lot of interest in understanding the influence of wolves and grizzlies on. Uh, most of it is focused on elk, but also more recently on moose, uh, and that's been that's been very challenging because essentially, at the same time that we reintroduced wolves to the Yellowstone and then as they expanded into the Greater Yellowstone, um, that was also the the time when we initiated the beginning of a 10-year drought, and so the the, the growth in, in predator numbers and the expansion of both wolves and grizzlies have essentially happened, you know, in the same decade that we've had this large-scale drought in in the Greater Yellowstone, and so so those two things are are highly confounded. Um, in the elk study, one of the ways that we kind of tease that apart is that is that pregnancy is um, we know that pregnancy is driven by growing season dynamics. And so the pregnancy signature that we see in, uh, in the elk study, we expect to be primarily due to forage quality on summer range. And, 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 and there you look, uh, we focus on the influence of warming and drying and changes in phenology. So, so the pregnancy, the reduction in pregnancy effects um, is a climate effect. On the in the elk study, and I didn't I didn't show you these data, but uh, um, there's been some pretty good work 
uh, collaring calves and looking at uh, cause-specific mortality of calves and the influence, you know, how many of them are being killed by predators. And there's been about a threefold increase in, in the mortality rates of calves um, before, you know, before wolves were introduced and after. Now, I'm, I'm using wolves as a, as a to demarcate the time period, but most of that calf predation is, is happening from grizzly bears. And um, so, so, so there's been, so we know that, that the uh, number of calves that are surviving, elk calves that are surviving, at least in our study area, uh, ha has declined as well. So there's a climate effect on pregnancy and then a predator effect on the calves. But you know, the relative magnitude of those is, is a bit difficult uh, to address. And in addition, I, one caveat I should give is that we know from other studies that if animals are in poor enough condition to not breed, some of those that do breed may also be giving birth to calves that are in that have low calf weights and are in poor condition, and that predisposes them, makes them more vulnerable to predation. So these things aren't completely independent as well. Thank you. And then Gregor was asking for the reference that you slowed, showed on the slide, trophic mismatch with the bird migration from Africa to Europe. Could you please repeat that? Yeah, the reference is, I mean, the, the actual citation? I believe so, yes. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a paper by Both and Visser, B-O-T-H, uh, Visser is V-I-S-S-E-R. And I can't remember if it, I, I think it was published in Science or Nature, I think, let's see, I'm trying to find it here. Yeah, it's 2001. Both and Visser, 2001. Excellent. Thank you. And then from Andy, it says, what are your thoughts on predator density and or diet selection to influence actual time and duration to forage? Um, can you read that again? Yes. It says, what are, you, uh, what are your thoughts on predator density and or diet selection to influence actual time and duration to forage? Hmm. I, so, um, okay, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, Andy, um, if you're on the phone, could you press star six and just kind of clarify what you're asking, please? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, thank you. you. Yeah, my basic question is more of a behavioral type uh, response I was looking for. Do you think with more predators and or a fewer or, or, or maybe a quicker time with a green up that uh, your large herbivores are, are are going to either shift the amount of time that they're going to be foraging, or is there going to be an influence of the predators to that? Right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so that that has been a that's been a, a question, especially with elk and wolves. Um, there's been this idea that that now that that elk have to live with wolves and be on the on the lookout for wolves that they might spend less time foraging, and that there might actually be sort of a wolf harassment effect. Um, and it's been proposed to to work during winter. Um, so the idea is that is that um, elk that run into wolves every day might, you know, spend less time in high quality forage patches, spend more time vigilant, and basically uh, end up with a nutritional cost or a physiological cost, not because they're being killed by wolves, but because wolves are keeping them on the move. So that's been the idea. Uh, it's referred to as a non-consumptive effect of predators. We did, uh, so Arthur Middleton, the PhD student I talked about, that was one of the chapters of his dissertation published last year. And um, 
we did a very comprehensive test of that idea, basically taking all of the elk in our study area for which we knew um, the amount of fat they had going into winter and the amount of fat they had coming out of winter, and th thus how much fat they lost in winter. We, we basically uh, took all of those animals and we had collared all the wolf packs collared, and we at, we basically came up with a score of how frequently each individual elk encountered wolves. And um, we did see some behavioral effects on the days when individual elk encountered wolves. They were more vigilant, they moved around more, but that only lasted for 24 hours. And those encounters only occurred once every nine days. And when you take and you rank all the animals by all the elk by their exposure to wolves, um, those that see wolves very frequently um, did not lose more fat over winter and were not less likely to be pregnant than those that saw wolves that, that or encountered wolves less frequently. So, so we tested that idea and didn't find any effect for the sort of a, a wolf harassment effect on the it definitely influences their behavior, but it's short-term and infrequent, and it didn't scale up to influence their nutrition or pregnancy rates. Thank you. Um, from Mary Reed, it says, does the stopover site change based on phenology changes in your, mu in your mule deer study? Um, <clears throat> well, so, if I understand the question right, you know, did the stopover sites change? Like, do they have different stopover sites in a dry year versus a wet year, or an early spring versus a late spring? Um, we did not look at that. Uh, we, well, we did look at um, their fidelity to stopover sites, and we found that um, the stopover that they do have fidelity to their stopover sites. So uh, the same animals. Or an, an individual will come back to the same um, stopover site um, from one year to the next. So the stopover sites aren't random on the landscape. They tend to be um, areas where of, of higher forage quality, and they use the same sites from one year to the next. So we did we could detect sort of a non-random association with stopover sites that so they're using the same ones. Um, but that, but our test was to see if if we could detect them using the same ones. Not we we didn't look at uh, you know when they when they change. Are they and you know are they making use of other stopover sites more frequently in some years than others? Um, so I, so we didn't look at that. But I, I suspect that they do. I suspect that um, you know so so basically when an animal's at a stopover site, they're they're, he they're feeding on this high quality forage and also gauging the forage quality that they're experiencing at that site. And so um, if, you know, in, in some years, because of how snow melts and how plants green up, there, are, there it seems to me that there has to be some stopovers that are more valuable in some years than others. And I suspect that if we, that if we did that analysis, um, we would see that that you know that they're they're using the, the portfolio of stopover sites that allow them to best exploit the phenological gradient that they're dealing with, you know, in in any given particular year. That's my expectation. We haven't done that analysis, but that, but that's what I expect we would see. Okay, thank you. And then it says um, from Polly, it says it looked like moose did not use stopovers like the mule deer did. Is that because the moose migration distance is shorter, or another reason? Um, yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, so, I didn't show all the data. Um, we do. So the moose are more are more variable. Um, there certainly are some moose, and this is true for elk too, that make their migrations in just a matter of days. Um, there are other moose that um, take much longer, um, as much as as much as um, you know, as much as a month or even longer, and and those moose appear to be stopping over. And and one of the ways um, 
we see it with moose. Is, so moose are often migrating up drainages. And one of the things that we see is they, they migrate you know, up a drainage, and then they, they might explore up a side drainage for a week or two, and then come back and continue on up their, up their main drainage up to their summer range. And so um, we definitely see it. I, I suspect in that we haven't done this stopover analysis for moose, but just looking at the data, I suspect that um, they end up stopping more over in spring because I, I think what happens with moose is that in moose are, are wintering at higher elevation, higher snow level areas. So I think on some of their migrations, they start and they basically run into a bunch of snow. And, and so they hold up, um, you know, sort of waiting for, for the snow to thaw while exploiting a stopover area, and then they plow on again. Um, but that's, that's just sort of my observation from, from looking at the data and, and seeing what those moose go through. But we, so they, they definitely do stop over, not as frequently as the deer. Thank you. And then John Martin, um, thank you. He put a post in the chat box for everyone to see. Yep. All right, Matthew, I just wanted to check in with you and see if you had any closing comments. No, I don't. I just want to thank everybody for, for joining online. And um, you know, if, if anybody ha wants to hear more, that, um, my contact information was should have been on the last slide. And, um, I'd be happy to visit with it, with anybody and provide any papers or other details about the studies I've talked about. And I want to thank the Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center for hosting this event and everybody for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matthew. And then Sean or Holly, any closing comments? Just thank you to uh, Dr. Kaufman. It was an excellent presentation. We appreciate it.